Hello and welcome back to the channel. Today we're taking a look at a Skywatcher Skymax 102. That's a 4-inch F13 Maxitov Cassegrain telescope. Let's check it out and see how it performs. You know, the popularity of small Max has just exploded in recent years. It's not hard to see why. The combination of a small package that's relatively affordable, that has a reputation for deep contrasty sharp optics that are very good on the moon, the planets, and double stars. This albeit at the expense of aperture and a relatively slow photographic ratio. Now there's no magic to the Maxitov design. What's happening here is in a traditional Mac design, the surfaces are all spherical. Spheres are the easiest things to grind, and when things are easy to make, your quality control can get very tight. The drawback of all of this is that in a traditional Maxitov design, the F-ratio does need to be fairly long, typically quoted at F15 or higher. Modern designs will kind of play with this a little bit, make it a slightly aspheric design. Sometimes they'll cheat and bring things in a little bit. This one's operating at F13. I didn't notice any problems with it. It's fine. So this product is part of a line of Maxitovs from 90 millimeters, that's three and a half inches, up to a large seven inch, 180 millimeters, and it may be available under different nameplates depending on where in the world you happen to live. This one is made by Skywatcher. There is an Orion Apex series here in the US that appears to be very similar, and again, it may be available under different nameplates depending on where in the world you happen to live. Depending on how you buy it, it may come with different accessories, including a red dot finder, or sometimes a traditional optical finder, a diagonal, a 25 millimeter eyepiece, and sometimes a soft carry bag. I have also seen these things packaged with small mounts. Check your local listings. Okay, so here we have the Star Max. Got a plastic lens cap here. See the curved meniscus lens there with the aluminized secondary spot. No markings there. The mirror looks very clean. You've got a Vixen compatible dovetail plate down here, and this is a welcome feature. One thing I do want to point out is this plate is rather short. So if you have a mount, for example, like my Celestron AVX, which I was using this on, the two bolts are spaced wider than the length of the plate here. So if that's the case, you can either just make do with one bolt, or if you want, you can try to get a piece of metal and sort of shim it in here so that the two bolts can come down on it and hold it secure. Standard binder dovetail bracket. In the back here, you have a rubberized focuser, and take a look at this. On these newer Macs, we have collimation screws. Very nice. So this visual back here is a standard visual back. You've heard me complain about these things before. Um, I have had people ask me, can you take this off and put a dedicated schmidt cassegrain visual back on here? So first of all, this is a lot better than the cheap ones you see supplied with Mead and Celestron telescopes. There's two locking screws here. There's no compression ring, but this is a more solid piece of equipment. And the answer is, if you have a SCT visual back, the answer is, no, this won't fit. This is a little bit too wide. But even with that, this is a very solidly made piece of equipment. I don't know if that's coming across on video. It feels serious and substantial. The build quality, for example, is much nicer than that of an ETX. So the first thing you're going to want to do is get or make a dew shield. I made this in five minutes. You know, you can buy these dew shields, but I don't like buying one for every single telescope that I own. So I just get some cardboard and put this on like this. Some people like to skip the idea of a dew shield with a Maxitov on the grounds that a Mac corrector plate is thicker than that of a Schmidt corrector plate. But trust me on this, your Mac will do over. Now about getting it on a mount, you can put it on an Altaz mount like this one. This is my Vixen Porta. This is okay. I actually don't love this arrangement and it's kind of hard to see unless you happen to be standing here. But while this arrangement does work on paper, in practice, and again, you kind of have to be here, it's a little bit clunky to use it this way. And I think it has something to do with the fact that the tube is so short, you actually don't have a lot of leverage here to move this when you're relying on these slow motion cables. Again, it's usable, but I prefer to use it on an equatorial mount. 
All right, so we've got it on the equatorial mount, and you'll notice I've gotten around this issue with the too short Vixen plate by simply bolting a longer one underneath it. I also like to use this to mount an auto guider, although astrophotography, not really this, this thing's forte. The optics on this thing, nothing to report, that's good news. No spherical aberration really to report, and the collimation is good. That's good also because I don't know if I want to fiddle with the collimation on a moving mirror on a Maxitov, so I'm going to leave that alone. Maxitovs are often popular with city dwellers. It's not hard to see why. Their compact tubes are easy to store, and with light pollution encroaching on all of our lives these days, in the middle of a big city, very often the only thing you can see is the moon, Jupiter, and Saturn. So I should probably address this issue of portability right now. I have a lot of people writing me about this saying they want to buy a Maxitov because it is portable. Is that true? Are Max portable? The answer is yes and sometimes no. Yes, it is true that Maxitovs have very compact portable dimensions, but with their relatively long focal lengths, you are going to need a relatively st stable mount to put underneath it. In other words, what you gain in portability and cost with the optical tube on a Mac, you very often lose back to the portability or lack thereof and the cost of the mount that has to go underneath it. So yes, the optical tube only costs around $320 US here, but the mount that I'm putting it on here costs over $1,000. Now, you don't have to put it on a $1,000 mount, but I like to actually have this thing overmounted. I like to be on that side of the equation. So having said that, two of the most common beginner's mistakes made with telescopes are, number one, they undermount their telescopes, they don't put it on a mount that's strong enough, and number two, they go to magnifications that are a little bit too high. Unfortunately, Maxitovs, with their relatively compact dimensions and relatively long focal lengths given their apertures, do tend to encourage beginners to do both of those things. As a result, I'm seeing almost an epidemic out there of undermounted Maxitovs. I got an email recently from somebody who was going to buy a Mac and he was going to put it on a very sturdy tripod. And few months later, he wrote me back. He says, I haven't been able to see anything. And, and I said, well, send me a picture of your rig. Tell me what you've got there. And the, the very sturdy tripod that he had, I think on a good day, might have held a smartphone. And of course, he put the highest magnification eyepiece he could in there just to make things really big. And of course, do the combination of those two things, you're not going to see anything. So does this thing do the Mac thing? Yes, it does. It is very good on the moon. It is very good on planets. There's no reason why you can't use it on deep sky. In fact, I've been doing it, but people for some reason tend not to do it. An analogy is you could use your little two-seater sports car as a daily driver, but most people choose not to. Within the confines of its aperture, it's fine. I mean, I looked at the Ring Nebula, I looked at the Dumbbell, I looked at M13 and M30, M92 rather, those globular clusters in Hercules. Right now, Sagittarius is setting in the west, and I could find all of the showpiece objects there, the Lagoon, the Trifid, the Swan, and the globular clusters in that area. You know, at F15, imaging isn't really this thing's strong suit. But there is one object out there that is bright enough to withstand an F13 to F15 focal ratio, and that is the moon. <laughs> Max have been used, they were imaging the moon now for quite some time, and in fact, Robert Reeves, one of the master lunar imagers in the entire world, uses a 7-inch Maxitov, I believe from Skywatcher, and I believe it's an unmodified unit. So I went ahead and tried this out. I put the planetary imager in here, and I took some of these images of the moon. Here is Clavius in the lower part of the moon, Copernicus, Gassendi, and Plato. Now, I've had people ask me, well, can you just try doing deep sky with a Maxitov like this? What would happen if I just stuck my camera in here and tried it anyway? And my usual response is, well, you can try it, but in all likelihood, not a lot's going to happen. So I'll try to show this to you. I put my Hutech modded 
full spectrum mounted DSLR camera that has a full frame sensor on this. And here's M17. Now look at what happens here. The image circle on a typical Maxitov is quite small. And as you can see, it doesn't come anywhere close to filling the full frame. And not only that, the lack of a dedicated coma corrector or field flattener means that even the illuminated area, you can't even use all of that. You've got to crop that in. In fact, there's so much distortion here that Pix Insight refused to calibrate, deep air, align, and integrate any of this stuff. I had to take all of these frames, put them into Deep Sky Stacker, that's a piece of freeware, stack it over there, bring it back into Pix Insight, and then crop it out and process it as normal. That's a bit of a hassle, but you know what? At this point, I was just trying to see it through just to see what would happen. So having done that, here are some processed images, and of course these are heavily cropped. This is the Ring Nebula. Here is the Lagoon in Sagittarius. And here's how that Swan Nebula came out. Now, these look okay, I guess. I would probably rank these as okay images. If you don't look too hard, they seem all right. But the more you know about astrophotography, the more you learn, uh, you're going to start seeing things in those images. Okay, so there you have it, a look at the SkyMax 102 from Skywatcher. And again, a Maxitov is a serious telescope, so please do treat it seriously by a serious astronomical mount for it. Keep your mount steady and solid. Keep the magnifications reasonable until you're comfortable with it, and then you can start moving up, and you should be fine. I hope this has helped you to decide if this telescope is right for you. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you soon.